Okay, so uh, the next thing that we want to talk about are some uh, differentiation properties or, or rules or laws, I guess you could call them. Um, there's six of them here. And uh, basically, you know, I, I had said before, you don't need to memorize a whole new set of differentiation rules because taking the derivative of a vector function really just looks like taking the derivative in the usual way of each of its component functions. However, we do need to take into consideration the fact that we've, de we've defined some new operations on vectors, namely scalar multiplication, dot products, and cross products. How does the derivative interact with those different operations? And um, uh, properties um, three through six here really address that. So let's, let's look at all of them really quickly. Um, this, the first two should look really familiar. If you have a sum of two uh, uh, vector functions, then the derivative of that sum is the sum of their derivatives. So that's kind of what you would expect to be happening. Um, same thing here, we, we see a similar property in Calc 1. So if you have a constant times a vector function, that's a scalar times a vector there, then the derivative of that is the scalar times the derivative of your vector function. Same kind of property that appears in Calculus 1. Um, what we see in properties 3 through 5 is three different versions of the product rule. And the reason we have three different versions of the product rule is because there are three different types of products that we can talk about with vector functions. We can be either multiplying a vector by a scalar, we can be taking the dot product of two vectors, or we could be taking the cross product of two vectors. And I wanna, I wanna be really, really careful with thinking about what each of these represents here. Okay, so first of all, Notice this says f of t times u of t. The f is not bolded. Um, and if you read up here, uh, f is, is stated to be a real valued function. I'm gonna be calling that a scalar function. It's, uh, it's a common term that we use for these when vector functions are also showing up because we know that the output of this is a scalar. The output of this would be a vector, okay? So this is like scalar multiplication. Um, when we're dealing with something like this and we take the derivative with respect to t, the result looks exactly like the product rule from calculus one, f prime of t times u, plus f of t times u prime of t. Uh, that looks just like your, your product rule, but remember the f prime and the f, those are scalar functions. The u's, the u and the u prime, those are vector functions, okay? So what would the result of this look like, a scalar or a vector? Well, a scalar times a vector is a vector. Same here. So this is a sum of two vectors, and the result would then be a vector. Down here, similar thing happens. So we're taking the derivative with respect to t of the dot product of two vector functions this time. Notice the u and the v are both bolded. Interestingly enough, the result is exactly like the usual product rule from calculus one, u prime times v plus u times v prime. Interesting, but that happens still with the dot product. I think your book proves this property. So it's worth taking a look at that property to see why that's happening, uh, or that proof, I should say. Um, what, is the, what does the result of this look like, though? Well, what is the dot product of two vector functions? We know that the dot product of two vectors is a scalar. The dot product of two vector functions would be a scalar function. In other, in other words, a function of t whose output is a uh, is is just another scalar. So when we're taking the derivative with respect to t here, we're differentiating a sing a, a function of a single real variable here, which is different than what we're doing up here. Up here, we're taking the derivative of a vector function, but both of those, both this vector function and this scalar function that results from this dot product, are both functions of t. So we can still differentiate either of them with respect to t, even though they're entirely different types of functions. Okay, cross product, the result of a cross product is another vector, and so here we're differentiating a vector function, and again, notice, we get something that looks identical to the product rule from calculus one, u prime cross v plus u cross v prime, okay? And then finally, property six, which we're gonna prove down here, is the chain rule for vector functions. Um, so think of it, first of all, you need to think of what the chain rule is for. It's for the derivative of a composite function. Now look at this composite function, u of f of t, where u is a vector function, f is a scalar function. Can a function like this even exist? Well, think about what kind of inputs and what kind of outputs 
these functions take and produce. f of t takes a scalar as an input and then produces a scalar as an output. u of uh, u feeds on scalars. So if the output of f of t is a scalar, then that's something that could then be plugged into u, meaning this has this has meaning. It's defined. Okay. So then, how do we differenti differentiate this? Well, we get something that looks identical to the chain rule from calculus one. We multi uh, we take the derivative of this outside function u. There's the u prime, but we don't change the input f of t. It's still f of t. However, we also multiply by the derivative of that input, uh, that input function, f prime. Okay, so this looks the same as the chain rule, but you have to remember that one of these functions is a vector function while the others are scalar functions. Um, I prove the chain rule down here. And again, I'm not going to walk through this proof line by line. I think it's a little more instructive if you try and make sense of it yourself. It looks kind of messy, but that's just because, again, we're dealing with vector functions, which have three components. Each of those components is going to be a composite function because we're dealing with composite functions here. See if you are comfortable with all this notation and can see why each step um, works. And then maybe after reading through this proof, it might become a little bit more apparent why the differentiation properties with vector functions looks so similar to their corresponding properties with functions of a single real variable. Okay. This next example uh, right here is one that appears in your book, but it's, it's a really, really important example because the result of this is going to be used in the next section for some, uh, for, for, um, defining some important uh, concepts there. So don't forget this specific result. Um, it should have, I could even call it a theorem instead of just an example. Um, but let's look at what it says. So let r of t be a vector function such that the magnitude of r of t equals c, where c is understood to be a constant. Now wait one second there before we go any further. This may not look like much uh, at at first glance, you might think, well, I know that the out that I know that the magnitude of a vector is uh, so, supposed to be a scalar. So isn't this always true? And the answer is no. If we go back to this example here, you remember in the previous video, we found the magnitude of r prime of t in this case, and uh, remember the result came out to a scalar root two. But if you also remember, I said that this won't always happen. Um, because this only happened because we had a useful trig identity that reduced everything down to a constant here. However, if these functions were different, this magnitude would have may have come out to some function of t that's non-constant. So that's kind of the thing that we're talking about here. This magnitude, or this, this norm, as we also call it, of r of t can look like some scalar function, f of t. If that function turns out to be a constant function, then that's the kind of R, that's the kind of R of t that we're talking about here. So if its magnitude is a constant function, okay, that, then that's what we're looking at. What we want to do is show that that function R of t under this condition is orthogonal to R prime of t for every value t. It's a really important result that comes up in the next section. So in order to uh, investigate this, let's start by squaring both sides of this. C squared equals the, the magnitude of R of t squared right here, okay? We know that the magnitude of R of t squared is the same thing as R dot R. We saw that back in section 12.3, that relation between the norm of a vector and the dot product, okay? Now this is an equation. If I were to differentiate both sides of this with respect to t, both sides of this are scalar functions. Both sides are functions of t. So on this side, because it's a constant, its derivative is zero. But what happens on this side? I'm taking the derivative of the dot product, r dot r. And from the uh, property up here, property number four, one of our product rules, we know how to take the derivative of a dot product. It's the derivative of the first dotted with the second plus the first dotted with the derivative of the second. So r prime dot r plus r dot r prime. Now remember, the dot product is commutative. So r dot r prime is the same thing as r prime dot r. In other words, these two terms are the same, and so I could call it 2 times r prime t dot r of t. Um, if I, and again, r prime dotted with r is a scalar. If 
that we're multiplying by 2. If I divide both sides by 2, I get r prime dotted with r equals 0, which again is the exact statement that r and r prime are orthogonal to each other. If their dot product is 0, that makes them orthogonal. Okay. Notice this will be true regardless of the value of t being used here. So that takes care of the uh, statement up there that this is true for all values of t. Now think about what this what this means for us. This little image came out of your book and it helps to make sense of it. Remember r of t represents a position vector. So uh, its, its initial point is at the origin, its terminal point is somewhere out in space. If r prime of t is orthogonal to it, um, we know from geometry that on a circle or on a sphere, um, the radius of that sphere is always orthogonal or perpendicular to the tangent line to that circle or a sphere uh, at that same point that that radius reaches out to. So in other words, this radius and this tangent vector should be orthogonal to each other. And what this essentially, the connection between these two ideas is saying that if r of t it represents a space curve where uh, its um, magnitude is a constant, then essentially what that means is that the, um, the vector function r of t represents a space curve that lies completely on a sphere of radius c. That's what that means. And you can see that here. See the space curve kind of wrapping around this sphere. That will be the case because again, the position vector represents a radius of that sphere, and from geometry, r prime will always be orthogonal to that. Okay, it's an interesting you know connection between geometry and the ideas we've looked at so far. Okay, a couple of big paragraphs here. I don't need to read through this because we kind of talked about this at the beginning of the first video. Um, a lot of this is me making kind of a big stink over the fact that people want to think of definite integrals as areas under a curve, when in fact that's not necessarily what they represent. And in fact, in the case of vector functions, that's not what they represent. Even though vector functions can give us um, a, a space curve or a plane curve, the uh, integral of that vector function does not mean or does not have a connection necessarily to the area under that curve over some interval. It, it means something different. And the point that we made back then was that it represents net change. However, the derivation, if you think of the derivation of uh, definite integrals in calculus one, where you look at rectangles, rectangular approximations under a curve over some interval, that exact process is estimating a net change over an interval. And I'm not gonna walk you through that whole argument because you do that in calculus one. But all that is to say that the most natural way to define the, um, the uh, definite integral of a vector function is to use that Riemann sum idea. So again, what we do is we, um, I mentioned this up here, if we wanna take a definite integral, then we're integrating over some interval uh, in the domain of that function. And the domain of vector functions are scalars, just like they are for single variable functions. So if we're looking at an interval, I oftentimes call this the parameter interval. If we're looking at the parameter interval a, b, and we wanna integrate a vector function over that interval, then what we're going to do is break this interval up into a bunch of subintervals, just like you do in calculus one. And now in calculus one, you use those subintervals to create rectangles but you do so using this idea. Within each of those subintervals, you select a sample point, ti star, for the ith subinterval. Um, plug that into your function, so r is what our function's called in this case, and then multiply that by the width of that subinterval, delta t. And again, that represents a rectangle, the area of a rectangle in calculus one. Here, it's just a product. Don't think of it as anything more than that right now. Then we sum up all of those, those products and that gives us an approximation to that definite integral. Applying a limit as n goes to infinity is what makes this accurate, okay? However, if you think about it, what is this vector function? Well, this vector function has components, and so if I plug ti star into each component function, f, g, and h, say, and then multiply the scalar into each one of those component functions, and then I sum all of those vectors, well, I would add their components component-wise. And what we end up with is, a, is an expression that looks like this. Now, each of these is a Riemann sum whose function is a scalar function, not a vector function. And so applying a limit 
to each of these component functions gives us the usual idea of what a definite integral is. And basically all of that argument amounts to this. If you want to take the definite integral from a to b of a vector function r of t dt, then that's the same thing as integrating each of its component functions from a to b as a single variable function and getting a vector out of that. Okay, so just like with derivatives, you don't need to learn any new integration techniques. We're simply integrating each component function. Um, indefinite integrals are defined in a similar manner. Now, sorry about the sloppiness here. I had a function that I was going to use as an example, and one of my component functions was un, uh, unintentionally too complicated for what I wanted to do in this example, so I, I did a different example down here. Okay, notice here we're asked to find the indefinite integral of r of t. So even though we talked about definite integrals here, we're doing an indefinite integral for this case. How do we do that? Uh, indefinite integral of r of t dt. I'm really just integrating each one of these component functions. So what is the definite integral of cosine of 2t? Well, that would be 1 half sine of 2t. But remember, with indefinite integrals, we pick up a constant of integration. So there's that plus C we normally get. However, I know I'm gonna get a bunch of constants of integration, so let's call it C1 instead. And that's my I, okay? And then uh, what's the what's the antiderivative for sec negative secant squared? That would be negative tangent. So negative tangent of T plus C2, let's call it J. Okay, and then here plus e to the 5t is what that is. So plus uh, 1 fifth e to the 5t plus c3. Okay, now these constants c1, c2, and c3, those are arbitrary constants, and in practice, we're not actually going to write them the way that I'm writing them here. Uh, the reason for that is this notice if I were to put this in component form instead of the standard basis vector form that I have it in right now. One thing I could write this as is 1 half sine of 2t, negative tangent of t, 1 fifth e to the 5t, plus a second vector holding all of those constants of integration, c1, c2, c3. Okay, now remember, each one of these is a constant. So I can think of this whole thing as a constant vector. And it would be easier to use a notation that just encapsulates all of this with one symbol. So really, it's much easier to just write this. 1 half sine of 2t, negative tangent of t, 1 fifth e to the 5t, and then call this whole thing just c, but use the arrow notation to indicate that it's a vector, not just a scalar. It is a constant vector, however, each component is a constant. So this is a, a better way to write our answer. And in practice, when you're doing uh, indefinite integrals in this section, like in the homework, don't bother with these two steps. I am only doing this once to show you where this C came from. Instead, just do the indefinite integral or the antiderivative of each one of these three component functions, and then just write this. Okay, skip this stuff. I don't want I don't want to see that in the work. All right. So that's going to wrap it up for 13.2.